Regulation, degradation, shaming, blaming enough. Is it time for sexual liberation yet? We talk a lot about sex, but not enough about pleasure. On today's show, we try to make up for that and hear from some bloggers, activists, and educators who are into very positive consent. It's all about pleasure this week on The Laura Flanders Show. It's the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. What has love got to do with it? Tina Turner asked a good question, but to update her a little, given how much we spend analyzing power and privilege, it's remarkable how little time we spend talking about pleasure and one of the most powerful forces on earth, lust. What might life, let alone sex, be like if we weren't embarrassed or shamed by our longings, if our pleasures weren't regulated, criminalized, or worse? On this program, we like to lift up the possible as well as the problematic, so let's talk about it in a world transformed. Where might sexual freedom take us? I am joined by activist, educator, and performer, Erica Hart, Tina Horn, host of the podcast, Why Are People Into That?, and author Jacqueline Friedman, whose pre-Me Too book was called Unscrewed, Women, Sex, Power, and how to stop letting the system screw us all. So this is fun. In the name of justice and movement building, we're gonna talk about bodies and pleasure and lust. So let's get started. Let's project ourselves into the future that we dream of. Um, Tina, what's liberation look like to you, feel like? Uh, I mean, I think it looks like the full global decriminalization of sex work uh -huh. and um, as a longtime sex worker myself and somebody who does a lot of creative and political work um, around the sex industry and covering the sex industry, um, I feel like I have so many design ideas and all the sex workers I know have so many design ideas about spaces that are either like spas or clinics or salons where people can explore and experiment with all of their fantasies and desires and the stigma is lessened at least you know maybe not completely but enough that you know when you take the criminalization right, so even away in your liberation you have a little bit of stigma yeah. <laughs> We were, we, were talking, we were talking about it a little bit you know as, as a queer person who has has seen uh has, has seen us gain certain rights even as it feels like one step forward five steps back in many ways but we sort of sometimes feel like oh remember how much fun we used to have like playing in the shadows <laughs> um so right. what about you erica your vision of the future maybe you feel it now no, I do not. Like that. <laughs> is this the future? <laughs> um, my vision for the future is the end of anti-black racism um, in, in its many ways of being an ideological framework um, and just in how people think about black people um, and also how it exists very present in our institutions. Yeah pre and post Trump, because yeah. oftentimes people just kind of like to kind of place it as if Trump is the resurgence of racism that wasn't always present. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that is for me what it's black liberation. Mm -hmm. It's when we actually start centering and start actually lifting up the voices and centering the voices and giving reparations to black people for what we've endured for hundreds of mm. years and living in this country is what that would look like to me because if I could go to work or walk down the street and not experience racism, pleasure for me is gonna be much more enjoyable because that's what I get to focus on. Oh, I, I don't have to focus on navigating racism. So let's talk about, you talk about people, racism, walking down the street, but give me the body aspect of that. I mean, it is black bodies mm -hmm. you're talking about. Yeah. How would living in yours be different? 
I mean, it would look different because I wouldn't have to consider if me going to the doctor as a breast cancer survivor, if that doctor is lying to me about the medicine that they're giving me, that they're providing, or that they care about my body because I'm black and they've been indoctrinated in a system that doesn't care about mm -hmm. black people. Mm -hmm. And medical institutions are absolutely um, right for that. Like they've, they've been taught that, they live in this system. We grew up in a racist country. It is definitely in our systems. It's there for people. So for me, I would be able to just go and be like, I'm getting taken care of. I don't have to mistrust this system. It's just one example, but it's yeah. really everywhere in my life. Yeah, what about you, Jacqueline? The word that I think of when I think of my pleasure, liberation, utopia is multiplicity, right? That we are going to express and experience pleasure in our bodies literally infinite different ways. And that there's decentering of the need for a norm whatsoever. But the other thing that I really think about is a world that doesn't keep sex sort of segmented off in the corner from all the other pleasures, mm -hmm. right? That I actually think, and I think this is an important thing for our movements uh, in terms of creating one movement, right? That we connect the dots between the need for sexual liberation and the need for uh, fat liberation and, and liberation around food policing, which also gets to liberation around economics and poverty and labor, you know, the liberation from the idea that we are our productivity and that, that pleasure is an extra for when you've earned it through the capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And the pleasure that like a black kid needs to be able to enjoy to play on the playground without fear of getting shot. Like these are all, connected because our bodies don't just wind up experiencing pleasure in one way and that that we we keep sex sort of mm -hmm. segmented off to the side even in our own movements most of the time um, and don't connect it with all of these other political movements that we're talking about yeah. and uh, and so that's that's the other multiplicity that I I want to see in my utopia is that we understand all the pleasures as connected. One of the great scholars and activists around uh, these topics is Amber Hollabaugh, and I remember her Ooh, on yes. this program talking about how do we even imagine a world that is different if we don't dare own our imaginings mm -hmm. or if we're ashamed by them. For a political movement to not understand that sexuality is a profound component of both how people are oppressed and how people dream is to not recognize the reality of political power and where it's centered. If I'm fighting for the possibility of having a kind of desire and possibility that right now is not too likely, it gives me a different kind of engagement with the future than, than if I say, oh, well, sex doesn't matter, it's private. Well, sex may be private in the way that you make love, but it's not private in the context of the world we live in. What is the reality today, before we come back to how do we change mm -hmm. it? Um, Jacqueline, you wanna kick off? Where does the carceral state, prisoning, incarcerating, policing, intersect with our sex, pleasure, lust, longings? One of the things I come up against in doing anti-violence work, which is part of what I do, is a lack of imagination on a number of fronts that intersect with, with those limitations. One is that when we talk about holding perpetrators of sexual violence to account, we inherently run up against the carceral state, yeah. which is also a place where, which facilitates an enormous amount of sexual violence, um, as well as a lot of anti-black racism and you know a lot of other harms as well. Because we want to take somebody who's abusing someone off the street, but at the same time, we don't want to necessarily feed the machine around right. incarceration. And so there are a lot of exciting folks who are working on ideas around restorative and transformative justice, but those also both are new and are also not complete yet, and, and I think that one thing that we see is a lack of interest or research funding into literally how do you rehabilitate somebody who's sexually offended? Like the question doesn't even get asked, right? What actually works? We don't, we literally don't know what actually works in a general sense in terms of taking someone who's willing to violate someone sexually 
and making them someone who's no longer willing to do that. Erica, this is something that your your community, you work on very closely often mm -hmm. too. What are you coming up with? I think we have to also think about, obviously the blatant, very physically violent ways that anti-black racism plays a role, but also in our anger. And in the 1950s, Audre Lorde wrote um, Sister Outsider and she talked about the uses of anger and acknowledging and affirming when black people are angry, especially black femmes are angry about experiencing racism and sharing that experience, how that is a connection to pleasure and how when you cut that off or when you tone police that anger, you are impacting that person's experience of pleasure because then they have to, oh wait, how, how can I be? How do I have to be in this space or how do I be in a bedroom or how do I be at a play party? What, how do I get to be? I'm always told how I'm supposed to be. I don't even get to show a very human reaction like anger. Mm. And I think we oftentimes talk about about physical violence, but we don't talk about the very, I mean, we can argue what is physical violence, but we don't talk about the covert ways that white supremacy plays a role and impacts black people, in, even in our reaction to it. Yeah. Because right. emotional yeah. violence is, Absolutely. is felt and stored in the yeah. body, yeah. often as trauma. Yeah, yeah, oftentimes called weathering in a lot of ways. Mm. Can yes. I build on that? I, one of the things that I think about a lot in the current Me Too conversation is, that it stops short of seeing women as being robbed of pleasure, mm -hmm. right? That there's a lot of conversation about whether men are being robbed of their ability to pursue their own pleasurable ends. And there's a lot of conversation about like women and our right to not be harmed, right? <laughs> but what's not getting named enough, I think in this conversation, which is I think part of what you're getting at is part of the harm of, of being violated in any way is it makes it harder for us to experience pleasure. And, and I really think that we need to get to a place where we see pleasure as a basic human right. Tina, let me have you come in on this because obviously the discussion around sex work has been very binary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have people on two sides that seem as if they will never meet. And the... people that you would think would have common grounds like feminists. Well, let, let me let's yeah. talk about it. I mean, yeah. to what extent are we getting any more interesting, for lack of a better word, in our discussion of this? Because obviously nobody at this table is for the sexual enslavement of people against their will. No. Period. Right. Period. Yes. Even the fact that, that we have to establish that <laughs> is, is, is a sign I've that I've done there... this topic before. Yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure you have. And, and, and I'm really glad that you brought it up in that way. You know, what I always say is that when the discourse, when the mainstream discourse, the discourse in the law, the discourse within feminism, talks about um, talks about trafficking when we talk about sex work, it's tantamount to talking about rape when we're talking about sex, right? So it's important for us to talk about rape within the context of talking about sexuality, but equating all sex work with trafficking is tantamount to equating all sex with rape. And so if someone says, I had sex, and someone says, well, you necessarily then were raped, then that takes away that, that person's ability to have sexual autonomy, to make their own choices, and to experience pleasure, even if that pleasure is the pleasure of getting paid mm -hmm. and making ends meet and having a livelihood, mm -hmm. which can also then contribute to the other pleasures of comfort and stability and economic justice. Leisure time. Leisure time. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like if I'm able to do my job and get paid and pay my rent, then I can relax and maybe yeah. also like masturbate or like, you know, like yeah. have, have my own, my own sex life and, and my own non-commercial sexuality. In your liberated world, post-capitalist, possibly post-patriarchy, <laughs> um, post-white yeah. supremacy, do you think you would still be engaged in sex work? I, I do. This is a, this is a good question. Um, I, I, I definitely disagree with the idea that that in in a post patriarchal world, in a post white supremacist world, that we we wouldn't have sex work, mm -hmm. that we wouldn't need sex work. I, I I definitely disagree with that. I think that if we can come to think of all of the the benefits of potential benefits mm -hmm. of of sex work, of of fun, mm -hmm. we're talking about pleasure, mm -hmm. of of healing, of connection, of communication, of 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 education. Mm -hmm. um, those possibilities are all there. And you know, when we talk about sex work, we talk about all different parts of the industry and all kinds of different manifestations, whether it's people having 
you know, what you might think of as heteronormative intercourse, whether it's people having uh, kinky interactions or fetish interactions, whether it's people being voyeurs and exhibitionists, you know, live shows mediated by technology and all the changing technology that we're seeing, uh, people dancing, people putting on shows, yeah, all different kinds of things. So um, I absolutely, I mean, I anecdotally have seen and know that adult entertainment can have tremendous positive effect yeah. right, so on, Erica, on people. Coming to you, we've already gotten ourselves into the situation where there's some language out there. You know, what do we mean by normal? What do we mean by healthy? Mm. What do we mean by kinky? What do we mean by vanilla? You mean, how do you, how does your story intersect with this whole discussion? It's a dismantling of what those words might mean. Um, I think, I'll tell you a little anecdote. Go for it. When I was in elementary school, the principal um, of that school would spank people when they got in trouble. And I remember very vividly getting in trouble and going to the principal's office as I knew that walk. And my classmates, like the whole class was walking down the hall and I made sure that they saw me on my way to the principal's office, like, hi, I'm getting in trouble. And it wasn't, I'm gonna go get spanked. It wasn't until I was much older that I was like, oh, that was key. I, I like, you that was key. It was an, exhi I an expression of exhibitionism. Yeah, yeah, that I was gonna be going to have this experience. Yeah. I didn't feel like I was in trouble, like a bad thing, but I also didn't have the word kink. Right. right. I just said. I don't think your principal did either. No, 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 not at that age. But I'm saying when I got older in high school, even right. in college, I didn't say things like kink. Like that wasn't available to me. And I feel like when I started talking to more white folks, they would say things like, "Oh, you're kinky. You like to be spanked." And I'm like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> and I feel like white people at their um, disposal have. Mm. Um, these words kind of like given to them. They have access to the internet, they have access to lots of books, just because of institutional mm -hmm, racism, mm -hmm. right? Because of the privilege that they have to kind of like talk about these things yeah. at nauseum. But if yeah, you yeah, are yeah. just trying to survive, right? Yeah. You're not necessarily like, oh, what is this thing I like spanking? Oh, I, that happened, okay, great. You don't really get to name what these things are. Fascinating. So That's for me, it's like, I get to claim kinky, but I get to say what that looks like for me. Let's let's play your piece here about, well, you'll, you'll see what it's about, but it touches on these themes of invisibility and being seen. What motivated me to go topless was the lack of visibility. Being that you do a Google search for a double mastectomy and there are all white images. We can't show this as a white disease because cancer is diverse and does not discriminate. When I first went topless in public, people of color came up to me and asked, what happened to you? If we see ourselves on TV, in movies, in books, then you know that not only can this happen to you, but you're not alone. We're not alone. What was the reaction to that piece from Viceland? Um, it was pretty positive. People like um, inspiration porn, and I think <laughs> that that is moving into that direction. Like, if you listen to it on mute, which is what a lot of people do with videos anyway, you could just be like, oh my God, she's so inspiring because mm -hmm. she has breast cancer. Um, but if you actually listen to what I'm saying, mm -hmm. like, if you read the closed captioning, I think people. I think what people want from a breast cancer survivor, especially a black breast cancer survivor, is to only be talking about breast cancer. Right. Not to be talking about dismantling racism or ending medical racism. They, it, no, we just talk about inspiring us and that's it. But my, my desire is not to that, that you're inspired by what? Like my body, I want you to be inspired into action. Yeah. To actually do something so black people stop dying at higher rates from breast cancer than white people do. You've also spoken powerfully about the information you were and were not given mm -hmm. around your body after cancer. Yeah, and I also, just to go backwards just a little bit, 
even in my sex ed classes, I wasn't given any information about pleasure or about kink or about the ways in which my body operates. Or if I were to get breast cancer in the future, what would my breasts look like? Breasts look lots of different ways. None of that information was given to me, but I was absolutely told that I need to use condoms. I need to um, check myself for STDs and STIs. I, I need to be afraid of STDs That's and STIs. Right. Actually, so it was all of this information oftentimes given to predominantly black communities about how we need to protect ourselves but not any exploration of pleasure. That's what sex ed looks like. Because society cares so much about the protection of black people. Well, it doesn't care about the protection of black people. It cares about um, us not reproducing, mm. right? And if we know how to wear a condom, if we are afraid to have sex, if we don't know where to access abortion, then we won't engage. That's the idea, right? It's another form of eugenics. It's just sneaky. Mm. Or if you, mm -hmm. if there's so much shame around it, then you don't seek treatment or you don't even yep. get tested. You don't know your status. Yep. It completely stops you from being able to have a pleasurable sex life. But this question of productivity comes in. Yeah. I mean, not to be the Marxist here, but oh, please. the history of black reproduction was that it was very valuable, mm -hmm. very yep. valuable to white supremacy and the slave economy. Um, when it was productive of value totally. for the economy. Is that part of this conversation too, Jacqueline, this question of pleasure isn't productive, so what good is it? 100% mm -hmm. it's part of that conversation mm -hmm. because when you keep people feeling like they have not earned the right to, the, to pleasure, when we don't have to, we have to earn the right to the pleasure in our own bodies, you keep us working, right? Absolutely. So yes, there's that absolute specific history. And now, of course, that black people have some amount more cultural power, that's terrifying and we don't want more black people, right? So we want to keep that, so the, so the power dynamic has flipped. And also there's stereotypes about black people being not productive workers and so. But it gets to the bigger yeah. question of how we're running our economy and the intersection with our social justice and transformation movements in the sense that, you know, if we actually put more priority and value in our pleasure lives, we might not want to work 100 hours a week. 100 percent. Three shifts, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Fear and shame are what keep us easily manipulative, mm -hmm. manipulated. When we feel a lack of shame and when we feel confident in our own ability to have a satisfying life, including satisfying pleasure of all kinds, it's a lot harder to motivate us to do mm. unpleasant stuff. So how <laughs> are, what can we learn from this conversation? Not just this conversation, but the conversations that you were all, you know, bringing into the room that are much bigger than this. Um, how would our movements be different if we learned more from, I don't know, people into kink, people into sex work? Um, specifically, maybe domination and S and M and bondage. All those activities yeah. have to do with actually seeking consent, coming to some kind of contract. Mm -hmm. um, could yeah. we play that out in other in other environments? Yeah, you know, something that I was thinking about when you were telling your story mm -hmm. is that we we don't have we have barely any mainstream real education about what BDSM is, mm -hmm. what kink is, what fetishism is, what uh, what sadomasochism is, all the things under that umbrella. But I just mean, and, what if we brought that consent-seeking practice Well, and, but that's the, the other thing, work we do? That, you know, BDSM gives people who may realize like, oh, I have an interest in exhibitionism, I have an interest in sadomasochism, I have an interest in domination and submission, all of which can be a part of spanking, and then learning how to consensually seek out compatible partners to experiment and play and, 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 like, and how to establish consent. How does that to my trade union? Or my but peace group. I don't think that you have to be kinky to learn these skills, which are about negotiation and consent, but also about valuing pleasure, right? Like my answer when you ask that question is, I think our movements would be a lot more fun and a lot attract a lot more people. Like more people would yeah. feel like they got to be their full selves, they got to show up as themselves and not as whatever piece happens to be useful to the movement at the time. And consent is literally in everything, right? Yeah. And the, the relationship that it's just attached to pleasure or sex is, I think, in a, a large part, the issue. If people got that it's without consent for you to touch my hair because you think it's pretty, mm. then then maybe they'd stop doing it so much, right? Or if people got that you need to actually ask consent to dump emotional labor on someone, then it would maybe in our move a little bit quicker. I was quicker, so struck. Right? I watched. Um, there's a wonder, another wonderful video online of of Erica and her partner Ebony 
on a show called Skin Deep. Mm -hmm. And you sit across the table from each other and ask each other these beautifully intimate questions that provoke really fascinating exchange. And I thought, what if we did that with our presidential candidates? Like, what if we did that with no. our, our bosses? <laughs> maybe different questions, but that right. practice of actually talking about some things that are maybe not being negotiated on the workplace in this contract right now, but can, speak to our bigger lives. Can we talk about the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez dance video briefly? Okay, we haven't got very long, but go for it. <laughs> I just think the freak out on the right about her literally just enjoying the pleasure of dancing with her friends mm. uh, speaks so much to the deficit of pleasure discourse in our politics and also how powerful a tool that is for us for our movement, that if we were the movement where people got to really enjoy and the, their full selves and be fully human, uh, we'd be working not, uh, so much of the movement is, is trying to stop harm. Yeah. And I think that when we bring pleasure into our politics, we give people something really motivating to work toward. What was we're it just, that Emma Goldman said? Yes, exactly. Pol we if I can't dance, I don't want to be part police. of your revolution. Yeah, I mean, the, the state representative of Tennessee said that the state of Tennessee is racist and they were, she was asked to resign. I mean, that's the same thing as, as, as dancing, right? But it's not related to in the same ways. It's like, yeah, let's celebrate um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for dancing, but not let's celebrate this black person talking about a state is racist. Like, let's lift that up as an expression of this is how I feel. This is also my hope to express myself in other ways. But no, we're going to police that. And then we're also going to police this over here. Mm. So it's just all a function of just police, 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 police. And I do think that BDSM in particular, but also all kinds of sexual exploration and liberation teach us to understand power and understand mm. the non-sexual ways that it works. And um, the more that we are able to fully express and explore that with other consenting adults, the more that we might notice all of the yes. insidious ways <laughs> and, and, and infrastructural ways and hegemic ways that, that power works on us. So sex can be a good tool for that. Well, I think we should have this conversation on a regular basis. Sounds I thank good. you all. Really thank you. incredible thank you. pleasure. Jacqueline, Tina, Erica. Um, <laughs> you can find out more about all of our guests at our website. And if you have never read it, there's a wonderful poem by June Jordan with the chorus, Tight. but what about moonlight? Tight. What if we ask that question of our movements and our weeks and the way that we spend our time? Thanks for watching.